interesting. Okay, so um, this is the uh, second uh, seminar, informal seminar, if I may say, of um, how to produce and purify proteins. And in those three modules, these three seminars, what we're trying to achieve is to give everybody an idea uh, of how we go about uh, cloning, expressing a specific gene, purifying the protein, and then using this purified protein for a variety of different purposes, whether it would be for diagnostic purposes, for uh, creating perhaps a monospecific antibody, and we're going to have that discussed uh, today, and also um, potentially also if it is very purified, to use it for uh, producing a crystal to ultimately create um, the solve the X-ray structure of a particular protein. And we hope after this first th this first three series, these seminars, we'll have a couple X-ray crystallographers uh, from the Department of Biological Sciences here to talk to us about this specific application. How do you get really a protein purified, crystallize it, and then determine its X-ray structure? So what I want to do today um, is take you through the second seminar and I will uh, discuss briefly purification strategies and uh, sort of summarize some of the chromatographic methods that are typically used to purify proteins. Uh, mind you, I'm not an expert in protein purification, so I'm going to focus on the things that uh, we are doing right now and we've gained experience in here. But I think for uh, being able to cover the entire story, we need to go through these procedures that are available to tell people how complicated and sophisticated it could be. And then we will focus specifically on affinity chromatography. And beyond only affinity chromatography, we will focus on what I call a um, dummy proof system or a system, uh, an automated system, the Profinia uh, system from BioRed which depends on a fully or semi-automated method using a particular system and equipment to um, use affinity chromatography to purify protein to 90% purity or better that could be used for most of the purposes that we're interested in. So let me go then quickly through um, uh, the beginning of the talk and then we'll focus on the specific applications. And the exact, we're going to have a couple specific examples that we're going to go through. And Dr. Muzamel Hack will follow me to really describe the Profinia system and the specific examples that we're going to go through today. So, um, so uh, there are various purification methods. I think a lot of you, many of you may already be familiar with those. So I apologize to those that are, are really advanced, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. And but I think for uh, the interest, the general interest of everybody, including students in the audience, it would be good to go through those very quickly. So there are various purification methods um, that use uh, different types of chromatographic methods based on charge, um, exclusion size of the protein using exclusion chromatography, hydrophobicity using hydrophobic interactions to retain molecules within a column. And also ligand specificity, and today we'll be talking uh, specifically about affinity chromatography, where a protein, uh, a specific protein, or a domain of a protein has an affinity uh, for a particular other protein or moiety, which is on a uh, column that could then force retention of this. We also can use uh, nucleotide coenzymes in resin, phosphoprotein resins, to really do uh, purifications for specific molecules. There are matrices under the affinity uh, avidin biotin matrices that could be either engineered or naturally occurring, carbohydrate binding, uh, dye resins, and ultimately precipitation uh, could be used to differentially purify proteins based on the solubility and precipitation profiles. One of the specific examples is ammonium sulfate to really concentrate uh, proteins out of solution. So precipitation is the first um, uh, technique that's quite simple. Uh, for certain things, it could purify proteins 50% to 70%, and sometimes even to higher um, uh, degree. So pr proteins tend to precipitate at their isoelectric point if the ionic strength of the solution is very high. So the first step in uh, protein purification is typically is done as a precipitation step. Ammonium sulfate and uh, TCA, trichloroacetate, acetate, are the most common salts at high ionic strength. Then you actually precipitate these proteins out of solution. 
So uh, fractional precipitation then, uh, taking into advantage the specific properties of the protein, you could use different ionic strengths to actually precipitate proteins out of solution, as it's shown here. And ultimately then, you could load the clean prod product into a chromatographic method, where there would be exclusion, ionic strength, or affinity chromatography later. So, um, in a chromatographic methods in general, we have a protein solution that has been uh, produced either um, as a um, uh, uh, directly out of an E. coli, bacterial, yeast, or other system, or perhaps through a concentration step uh, through precipitation, or perhaps even through some kind of an ion exchange um, um, uh, to modify the, the buffer that's in to create a buffer solution that would be ideal to load for this particular column. So the protein solution is applied, uh, the column is a solid porous matrix, uh, has a stationary phase and a liquid phase. Liquid phase is the liquids that you pass through to be able to actually either immobilize, uh, 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 wash the column, as well as elute whatever has been bound afterwards. And of course, the mobile phase can be adjusted to increase or decrease affinity of protein for stationary phase gradient, which means by doing different ionic strengths and different solvents, you really could modify what's been washed off or, uh, uh, from that column. So uh, the adsorption chromatography, proteins bind to stationary phase. Uh, the proteins are eluted by altering the mobile phase, which is a liquid that you push through. And this uh, adsorption chromatography includes affinity, hydrophobic interaction, ion exchange, and chromatofocusing. Uh, solution phase chromatography, uh, which is basically in a uh, solvent type of uh, um, uh, structure, proteins do not have to bind to a stationary phase. Progress of the proteins to the column are impeded by metrics of a stationary phase, and that includes size exclusion chromatography uh, as well as uh, you know, gel filtration. Um, Sophisticated chromatography um, is uh, facilitated by sophisticated equipment. Uh, these are uh, automated uh, chromatographic uh, equipment that could utilize a multiple columns that are, are put typically in tandem. So you could have a um, early column that could be a washing column. You could have a um, ionic strength column or hydrophobic column followed by a size exclusion column and perhaps end up with an affinity chromatography column before maybe you use um, high pressure liquid chromatography to really come up with extremely clean product that you want to crystallize. Uh, we're not going to focus on these advanced technologies and multiple of these uh, um, chromatographic methods, but uh, I want you to be aware that if you're really interested in very serious and purifying proteins, um, then you would have to most likely uh, go into and use um, the whole repertoire of these um, uh, uh, purification methods to really come up with a 99.9 percent .9 or you know uh, purified protein. But these systems are typically run in the cold, so you don't degrade the protein with protease inhibitors, and they have um, ways to apply the buffers. Uh, their detection systems to actually with ultraviolet uh, uh, UV rate, uh, detectors to detect which fraction uh, your protein may be coming out with and could be automatically collected through a fraction collector. So this is uh, a typical profile where you have an increasing parameter shown in the y-axis versus the volume of the buffer on the x-axis. And as you have the column uh, run through different solvent buffers, uh, you end up eluding the protein of interest uh, that could be picked up by uh, its UV absorption, and then you will know on which um, specific uh, fractions will be collected, and those then will be analyzed further. So um, proteins uh, obviously are fractionated, separated by the chromatographic method based on different uh, parameters, and then are collected uh, individual test tubes for analysis. In size exclusion, uh, this is very simple. You smaller proteins versus bigger proteins, they will be eluded um, based on the uh, ability to be excluded at the specific molecular weight on the column that you're actually using. So by simple uh, determination of size, you could actually elute a, um, a preferentially smaller proteins versus larger and so on, because they will come in different profiles. In ion exchange chromatography, um, you could use um, a large net positive charge or net positive charge, negative charge or large negative charge columns to really uh, retard proteins, the mobility based on, on charge. 
And those then again would be purified um, uh, based on how they come out of the column and collected in different fractions. Um, the same thing is true for hydrophobic interaction chromatography using different media. If the protein is more or less hydrophobic versus something else, you could actually purify them based on, on the um, uh, hydrophobicity or the domains which the protein may be hydrophobic could be retained preferentially or retarded preferentially in a column like this. So I'm not really concentrating on this because I want to go into this, which is really the subject of our talk today. But just for the uh, sake of um, inclusion, I wanted to go through quickly on to tell you that there are other methods, not only affinity chromatography. So we'll focus today on affinity chromatography. This is a chromatography which is most commonly used. It's an adsorption chromatography method. It can be used on protein with natural ligands that could bind to a specific um, uh, substrate. Often involves covalent attachment of affinity tag to a protein uh, with the advent of the fact that uh, we could engineer specific tags, amino acid segments, that have a preferential binding to a ligand. We can modify any protein to bind to a selective uh, ligand that we, then we could use for purification purposes. Because of the unique tags, uh, provide rapid specific cleanup in one chromatography step, and we'll demonstrate that. Um, then uh, you, you can come up with uh, better than 90% purification in a single chromatography step. It also allows for automation of protein purification, and this will <coughs> demonstrate with a pu uh, Profinia uh, purification system today. So again, the affinity chromatography, mixture of proteins are loaded onto a column. Um, then uh, because they have a specific ligand, they will bind to the a specific protein that binds to a ligand or a segment that binds to a ligand, like a, a, a epitope tag, it will bind, get retarded, and then uh, to different solvents, we could elute it at, uh, at the will uh, and purify it away from uh, proteins that do not bind or impurities um, that will wash um, uh, very fast through this column. So purification of tag proteins uh, and nickel uh, agarose uh, is used often to purify recombinant proteins that contain a polyhistidine uh, sequence. This takes advantage of the fact that the um, histidine uh, residues in tandem, typically six, sometimes nine, uh, bind to nickel uh, columns, uh, moiety, and then that could be used as an affinity chromatography uh, module to really separate proteins. Also, stradabidin agarose uh, used often to purify biotinylated recombinant uh, proteins. So if you have a biotinylated protein that could be chemically biotinylated, you could then purify it into a stradabidin uh, column by affinity chromatography. So popular small affinity tags, and we discussed some of them in the first lecture when we talked specifically about cloning and how do we, what kind of cloning expression vectors we have. Histidine, um, and that we will use the nickel, uh, talon, or cobalt uh, matrix. Could be eluded by metazole and low pH. Typically, the residues of five to fifteen histidines in tandem, and um, uh, it's an inexpensive resin, and uh, it can produce the protein in native or in denaturing form. Flag um, epitope. The flag epitope uh, consists of uh, eight amino acids. Uh, there is a specific monoclonal antibody has been generated to the flag epitope that could be used for detection as well as purification purposes. So the anti-flag in the body would be mobilized onto the matrix, and then the flag-tagged protein would be run through it to be purified. This is also very specific, although uh, occasionally has a hard solution uh, conditions. So you have to uh, use increasing salt conditions to be able to elute the protein out of it. Uh, strept avidin, uh, S-peptide, uh, as well as multiple other tags that we have a monoclonal antibody against them, or the bind to a resin can be used to modify any protein that could then be used for affinity chromatography. Large affinity tags could also be used for purified <coughs> proteins. And those typically are larger proteins that have natural ability to bind to a uh, substrate. So maltose binding protein, it binds uh, naturally to amylose columns. Uh, we use the uh, maltose, uh, which is um, uh, similar structure sugar to really uh, destroy that interaction and loot the MVP bound protein. It's a fairly large protein, 40 kilodaltons, approximately 400 amino acids. Um, it increases solubility <coughs> of the protein. So if you have a protein that actually is produced into inclusion bodies and it's not very soluble, 
by uh, including a larger tag, whether that would be a maltose binding protein or gluto glucose uh, as transferase, you could, you may be able to increase the solubility of the protein and have the protein then more soluble other than bacterial or other extracts. So for GST, uh, glutamase transferase, you use glutathione as a uh, matrix that naturally binds GST and reduced glutathione is used to elute the protein. This protein is a 26 kilo daltons, it's also inexpensive uh, resin. Uh, there are cellulose binding proteins, calmodulin binding peptides uh, and thyrodoxin uh, which is also used um, in conjunction with nickel ten talon uh, matrices, um, just similar to the 6-histidine tag, to also uh, bind and elute proteins. And I think uh, Muzamel will talk about one example where a fusion protein using paradoxin is used to purify the armadillo CD8 uh, protein, or at least a portion of CD8 protein, um, out of um, E. coli. Typically, uh, a larger tag is used for solubility purposes. I did talk uh, last time about the Suno protein from Invitrogen that actually uh, increases the solubility of a particular protein in E. coli. People use also um, uh, saperones separ uh, and other proteins to increase solubility of a protein that may be otherwise formed. Very hard inclusion bodies in E. coli, which means they cannot be really uh, solubilize unless you use 5 molar urea, and then you have to consider methods of renaturing the protein afterwards. So, which tag to use? Um, well, that's the guessing game. Uh, it really depends on the day and your experience, and all of this is really quite empirical, but there are certain rules that you have to abide uh, and could probably help you in selecting which tag to use for what purpose, um, for what specific purpose you want to use them. Um, they're basically selected on the specificity of binding interaction, the cost of the resin, uh, whether you want a native versus denaturing elution. So if you're really using denaturing conditions, uh, that binding has to be much stronger to retain the presence of metals, expression level, solubility, toxicity of the target protein, and also quite important, whether that tag can be removed efficiently afterwards because you may not want the tag as part of the native protein for a variety of reasons, because you may uh, alter the characteristics of the protein, you may not be able to crystallize it with the protein, meaning that the structure could be affected if the tag is on there, especially if you have a larger tag. So tag removal is uh, an issue and has been solved, as I will tell you earlier, by using methods to, uh, right now, where uh, you could remove the tag. And typically a tag can, can be removed by including into a linker between the protein and the tag a specific site, an amino acid sequence, which is a target of very specific protease. Um, and that then could release the protein from the tag. So these are uh, some of the uh, proteases that are used in kits from Invitrogen, Novagen, and other companies. Enterokinase, there's a specific uh, cleavage site, the factor uh, XA protease, thrombin, uh, uh, tobacco aging virus protease, and this is protease is very specific for plants, so therefore you, know, you can hardly find that in a mammalian species, and the precision protease um, uh, that's used in different vectors. And all those have advantages and disadvantages, uh, but mind you, those proteases, in order to be active, they have to be exposed. So if you actually create a protein that the protease is actually internal, and somehow you haven't solubilized it correctly, you may not have access to the protease. Therefore, you may not be able to cleave off the tag very effectively. So, um, so in terms of liquid chromatography techniques, advantages and disadvantages quickly, affinity, which we're focusing on today, is very quick and specific. Uh, resins and ligands can be expensive occasionally, uh, but you can create your own ligands, you create your own columns, and it will reduce those costs uh, very effectively. Uh, the resolution is typically low to medium. The rest of them have different types of properties. And typically in a uh, purification laboratory, especially if it's done for uh, pharmaceutical purposes, a combination of these uh, chromatographic methods are used combined with high pressure liquid chromatography to come at practically homogeneity, which is typically close to 100% of a purified protein away from any toxic substances, uh, small or large, or any other contaminating proteins. So then 
You purified your protein, how do you really detect it? STS, uh, polycryomide gel electrophoresis, visual confirmation, right molecular weight, uh, for instance. Uh, you could do a UV spectrophotometry, absorbers into 280, and this is the, uh, the, your recorder through your chromatographic method will actually show you this uh, because that's what it records. And you can use colorimetric techniques, whether it would be Bradford, Larry, or BSA tests that are already available in kits to really determine how much protein you have if you really want to come up in terms of micrograms, something that you need to use for your experiments. Uh, so in terms of final steps of purification, um, you, you have to test for interfering contaminants from extracts, especially if you're using your protein for biological assays. You want to know whether there are nucleases, proteases, are the toxins in there. Um, you can concentrate your proteins using precipitation, using centricons or other small columns, spin columns, uh, to uh, concentrate them. And then you ultimately have to use a storage bath or in storage conditions um, to really store it if you want to use it at uh, longer time intervals. So you need to consider the intended use of the protein. You may want to consider adding stabilizing uh, additives, and you may want to flash freeze the protein and store it at minus 80 degrees. Otherwise, it will be degraded, even if there is low contamination by some kind of a protease out of your E. coli extract. Confirmation of the identity of the purified protein. You can use uh, physical methods as mass spectrometry and terminal sequ uh, sequencing or any other analytical assays where they will be enzymatic or functional assays to really determine what these proteins they want that you really want based on your specific application. So if I was to sort of summarize the basic scheme of protein purification, um, back here. Here we are, uh, we're growing the, um, we have cloned the gene into bacteria, we expressed it, we lyse it through various methods, we remove the cellular debris, uh, we end up uh, doing some precipitation with soil organic molecules to capture the protein. We go through an intermediate purification, uh, uh, liquid chromatography, as we mentioned, affinity chromatography. And then ultimately we need polishing, which is really to clean the sample, whether it would be for storage or other purposes, before we really to use it. And that really will be specific on the type of use uh, that the protein is intended for. So general guidelines for protein purification. Objectives you have to define from scratch. What is the protein you want to go? What do you really want to do with it? Uh, and you have to think the process from the beginning to the end. You have to define the properties of the target protein and its critical contaminants, especially if you're really intending to use the protein for a biological functional assay. You um, minimize the number of steps, especially in the molecular cell biology lab that we you know, may not have readily all the uh, physical methods or chromatographic methods at your disposal. And you can use a different techniques at each step if you can, and ultimately developing analytical assays to determine whether that protein is functional, and that will depend on the specific use. Um, now, I'm going to very quickly, before Muzamel, I'll give the floor to Muzamel to talk to the Profilia system. I will uh, mention a, one application that we're particularly interested in, which is quite important, I think, to every biology laboratory. Um, it, it, and the, the, the application is the generation of a monospecific antibody against a specific protein as quickly, as inexpensively as we, we could, and as quickly as we could. And part of the idea is to really um, pick up an unknown gene, pick a fragment of the gene that codes for, uh, codes for the most immunogenic part of the protein, code and modify that segment to be expressed in bacteria, at high levels, purify that protein using an affinity chromatography protocol, and then use that as an immunogen to immunize rabbits or mice and generate a more specific antibody against that protein that will work hopefully in Western immunobloods, immunofluorescence, or other applications. And as you know, most of you have bought antibodies from companies. They will send you 50 to 200 microliters at three to $500 each and then you run three or four immunoblots and you run out of the antibody and you have to go back and buy more. And some of them are very good, some of them are not very good. It would be nice to have 50 mils or 30 or 40 mils of a very nice monospecific antibody that you could use at will without worrying about how much you used um, uh, each time. So uh, this is uh, an application uh, uh, specific that uh, uh, Muzabel will actually give you some more specific uh, details about this. 
And we um, collaborated uh, with Tempest Biotech, which is here in Baton Rouge, to try to create more specific antibodies against a putative CD8 uh, protein of, uh, encoded by Armadillo. And that was uh, for Dr. Uh, Richard Truman from the Hansen's Disease Center. And I'm calling it putative because um, through sequencing, um, high throughput sequencing, they had picked up a frame that looked like CD8, but of course it's Armadillo. It has never been published before. Um, and they were trying to characterize it. So the idea was, can we generate antibody against this and then be able to use it? So typically when you have a blind sequence and you do not know what they codes for a uh, particular protein, you have to do an open reading frame analysis. And this is done uh, quite nicely at the NCBI website, which is shown here, where you look in open reading frames, you plug your sequence in there, you look for open reading frames, and if your open reading frame matches approximately the size of what you really intend to, you will come up with a specific protein. As you can see here, the biggest open reading frame is here, and that actually really matched what we thought it would be, in terms of homology and other uh, parameters, a um, CD. Um, eight-like molecule for armadillo. And then um, we uh, look at the uh, molecule and we look uh, using different parameters. And I think on the next, uh, is it here? Oh, maybe I have it on the previous site. Um, there is a uh, nice website uh, that uh, will project at different algorithms to look at the antigenicity, linear epitope conformation, and uh, child plasma distribution of a particular protein. And by using these algorithms, you can get an idea what are the more immunogenic or potentially antigenic immunogenic parts of the protein, and then focus of these proteins to either generate peptides or to even uh, clone a piece of that gene that codes for immunogenic part of the protein. So this is an um, antigenicity profile out of this uh, website, and I'll give you the website I think, in subsequent slides, where you can see uh, total antigenicity is measured here, and you can see this protein, at least it's quite immunogenic, uh, antigenic. And these are the predicted peptides that would be uh, immunogenic if they were to use as immunogens themselves. So you could generate those peptides by synthesis, or you can focus uh, on these peptides, or really because we have the ability to synthesize a synthetic gene, we can order any gene. We go on the GeneScript website, we could actually take all these potential epitopes, zip them together into a hypothetical gene sequence, bracket it perhaps by a linker, and then create a synthetic gene that contains all of the potential immunogenic epitopes. And that would be probably the uh, idea way to create a uh, very immunogenic uh, protein that would represent or induce antibodies against the native protein. So these are the peptides predicted out here. And you can also do linear epitope prediction. Now, these linear epitopes are epitopes that um, are independent of confirmation, that would generate antibody that would bind to that epitope under denatured conditions. So if you denature the uh, protein, put it on a Western immunoblot, uh, then that antibody should react with a linear epitope. A conformational epitope is an epitope that is composed of amino acids that could be perhaps distal to each other. Amino acid 350, 300, and 400 contain a, become a conformational epitope, although a linear epitope are really just sequential amino acids that um, uh, uh, could be generating an antibody response. And this is a reference below here. And this is the uh, immunoepitope.org tools, immunoepitope.org is a website that contains five algorithms to really predict uh, which are immunogenic portions of this protein. You can also use the expasi.org uh, uh, number of tools to really look at the proteins, whether they're glycosylated, there are a variety of tools there you could use. And perhaps at some point in the future, we could go through the software and how they are used uh, properly. So obviously, I told you earlier, how do we do this? We focus on the most immunogenic part of CD8 for Armadillo. So we focus on approximately 150 amino acids that will contain the most uh, immunogenic or antigenic epitopes. Then the sequence was sent to GeneScript to be uh, called and optimized for E. coli expression. Typically, it uh, cost about a couple hundred dollars to synthesize a 450 base pair fragment. And GeneScript will send it to you already cloned into a plasmid. Uh, 
uh, um, that they have and could be moved quite easily, as we mentioned on the first uh, module, by restriction enzyme digest to any other vector you want. So we did that. It was code and optimized. We put specific uh, restriction sites at 5 prime to 3 prime for mobility. And then Muzamel will um, talk to you about how then uh, the Profinian system in conjunction uh, for uh, with specific application of the CD8 of Armadillo, as well, I think he'll talk about uh, purifying and creating a more specific in the body against West Nile virus, um, e-glycoprotein. Muzamel, for you.